Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. Today is Sunday, September the 9th. Today is the 9th, right? Yes, I think yes it, is. it is. It is. We are here at the brewery at Orange County Hops in Walden, New York, and I'm here with owner and proprietor, Mr. Mike Antonelli. Thanks for joining us here today. You're welcome. So some of you thanks may be, me, thanks, for, uh, thanks for having us here at your establishment. <laughs> so some of you may be asking, well, what the hell is this music guy doing in a, in a brewery? Well, I'll tell you why. So this, uh, this brewery happens to be about six minutes from my house, okay? So one day my friend Sam and I decided to come down and check it out when they opened, and we've been here pretty regularly ever since. But as we've been free frequenting this fine establishment, uh, I found out that this guy over here is actually a very accomplished musician. He has a long history in music, specifically jazz, but other genres as well. And I kind of thought it'd be a good idea for you guys to hear how a local person kind of got his start in music and then eventually opened up a fun place like this. And we do have live music playing here pretty regularly as well. So, um, and for all of you folks who live in the Orange County area, I urge you to get down here. We're on Route 52, right between Newburgh and Walden. It's called the Brewery at Orange County Hop. So Mike, uh, Tell us a little bit about kind of how you got the music bug back, I'm assuming, when you were a kid. You know. Well, if you want the history from the beginning, <laughs> it's a long story. Okay. Well, but long we, is good. We could start from uh, my grandfather, uh, on my maternal grandfather, was a saxophone player. Uh, my maternal grandmother was a piano player. And... Uh, Kind of, this is going to be the end of the story as well. It's a full circle in the sense that my grandfather um, had a tavern in Newburgh. And my grandmother played piano and my grandfather played sax. And they, they ran this tavern and um, it was called Franz Bar and Grill. Back, yeah, whereabouts was that? It was on Washington Street, okay. right across from the uh, recreation park in, New, in, uh, in Newburgh. And that's where my, right next door, my uh, grandfather was born and raised. Hmm. His name was Art Frangello. Uh, you know, he he uh, he had a storied uh, career as a as a recreational saxophone player, um, and his real, if I could say this on on YouTube, his real occupation was bookmaking. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he ran a tavern. Okay. Well. <laughs> so. <laughs> But anyway, so that's where my, my musical roots came from uh, originally. My grandfather bought me a professional saxophone when I was 10 years old. I'd been playing for a little while in school. I went through a diff couple different instruments, but I settled on the set, not settled, but I discovered the saxophone around the fifth grade. My grandfather heard me play and said, I think, you know, this kid could be something. So he bought me. The, uh, was there anything that marks. sparked the saxophone for you? Did you like hear a specific artist like on the radio or something that said, "Hey, I want to play the sax"? Well, back in those days, you know, I, w I was a uh, only ten years old. I was exposed to the music that was in my house, and basically, my older brother and sister were listening to you know rock and roll, and mm -hmm. and uh, I got introduced to bands like. Uh, you know, Jethro Tull and the Eagles and Led Zeppelin, like everybody else in this area at the time. So I wasn't really a jazz fan. But my grandfather brought home a record. Um, I'll never forget. It was, uh, it was a Cab Calloway Orchestra. And it was a saxophonist named Chu Berry from 1925, I think. His recording was made or thereabouts, 1925, 1930 or so. And the recording was A Ghost of a Chance. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was obsessed with Coleman Hawkins okay. and Chew Berry, right? Chew Berry died very young, in his 20s. But my grandfather loved that big sound. I used to call it the foo foo sound because it was a big, breathy <laughs> sound, you know? And uh, it was people that, that had that same style that developed from, from you know, Chew Berry and Coleman Hawkins. We're talking people like Ben Webster, like uh, Dexter Gordon, uh, like. Uh, Sonny Rollins later on. So, right. you know, that, that whole line of saxophone playing, that's what my grandfather was into. So he brought this record home. I kept listening to it and listening to it. Next thing he brought me was uh, Coleman Hawkins and the classic rendition of Body and Soul. So there I was listening to Coleman Hawkins, trying to imitate that, you know. Uh, so Which is you, what most young musicians yeah, do. It's like yeah. you, you get an instrument, you get hooked on it, and you try to replicate the, the songs and the sounds of your heroes. And that's that's 
happens to everybody. Right, yeah. right. And that's, you know, I was fortunate enough to have somebody who could turn me on to that kind of music. Once I got a couple of years into it and I was getting pretty successful, I, I was offered uh, some um, solo opportunities in uh, junior high school and, and beyond, you know, and I was playing in all county bands and I was moving, you know, into the upper echelon of my peers as far as playing goes in a, you know, big fish in a little pond, so to speak. Uh, and I, I discovered Coltrane, yeah. who I fell in love with. And my grandfather... How could you not? And my grandfather was like, oh, that sound is horrible. You know, you can't like... What are you listening to, boy? He told me, boy. What are you listening to that for, boy? Listen to this guy. He's got a better sound, you know. And uh, so, but that's how it, it slowly evolved. Uh, and I eventually... Uh, I found... Uh, when in the mid-70s I started listening to some fusion, I discovered Michael Brecker. And he just blew me away. You know, I mean, there was, he was playing a music that was more stylistically close to what my friends were listening to. You know, fusion was on the kind cusp. Rock and roll, yeah. On the cusp right there. And, but yet, and at the time, you know, I had Michael Brecker's, uh, uh, Brecker Brothers back-to-back -back album Good. with uh, Grease Peace and, uh, uh, oh, the funky, uh, I forget the exact title for it, but uh, anyway. Uh, an important album in the genre. A very, very time, yeah. important album at the time, and in that that kind of during that period in the mid seventies, when I was leaving junior high and going into high school, it kind of cemented my vision that I wanted to be a musician, and that that's what I wanted to do. So at that time, you know, obviously growing up here in the Newburgh area, did you feel limited by how much you could learn and do with your music? here in Orange County, that you, that you start to think that I need to kind of broaden my horizons and find somewhere else that you can kind of... Absolutely not. No? No. I was so fortunate to to have lots of uh, music opportunities. While I was still in high school, uh, a band formed uh, led by a uh, Newburgh guy named Joe Page, and he formed this band called the Wetheads. I don't know if you remember them. Hmm. Yeah, that Sam right. remembers that. Yeah. yeah, so I was one of the original four members of the Wethead Band, and I was still in high school, and we're going, you know, the drinking age was 16 or 18 then, and, and I'm 17 years old, going into bars and playing with this band. We played all over. In fact, we, we actually played at the, the Rockland House in Roscoe, which is right next door to the Roscoe Brewery. Brewing Company. <laughs> Isn't that <laughs> ironic? Yeah. Yep. But that was back in like 78. Uh, so I went away to college. Uh, I got accepted to the University of Miami. And uh, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Uh, Miami had a great jazz school, but I was accepted more as a, a classical a track uh, musician because I wasn't into jazz yet. And in fact, it was at Miami that I really kind of That's changed direction and, and found the jazz bug. Um, but uh, at Miami, I went had to go, all saxophone players had to audition. Well, little did I know that I was auditioning for the classical track. You know, I thought I was just, you know, auditioning for whatever. I was very versed in music theory. I took theory in high school. And in fact, I got in, accepted into the, uh, the advanced freshman theory class there at Miami. But... Uh, Dennis Cam was my instructor there. I never forget him. Great man. But I sidetrack. Um, they asked me to. I walked into this audition, and they said, "Well, what do you know? What, what solo have you prepared?" And of course, I had really no <laughs> classical or jazz training. So I said, uh, "Oh, I, I know the solo um, um, off of uh, Dark Side of the Moon, uh, of the solo on Money from Pink Floyd." So I got about halfway through, and the guy says, oh, hold it. Wait a minute. Okay. You can go over there. Good job. Thank you. Thank Not you. what we were expecting. No. And, and, you know, and so I didn't know what was going on. And, and they, they, you know, later they told me, well, you know, this was for a certain uh, jazz school or the classical thing, whatever. And, and they, they put me as a um, music theory major, you know, when I went there. So. I lasted about uh, four months at Miami, That's it, huh? then transferred 
to uh, UConn to get closer to the love of my life because I couldn't stand being a part in uh, in Miami. Alvy should come over and say hello now. That's, yeah. that, that's your cue. That's your cue. You know. <laughs> so, uh, and then uh, from from UConn, after you know, I kind of re revamped and found my direction again. I. We, uh, we both went actually to uh, to Boston, and I got accepted to Berkeley, and that's where things really started to pop for me. The rest, as they say, is history. Right? Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Yeah. So that was what the early eighties. Yeah, or nineteen eighty to uh, nineteen eighty two. Graduated from Berkeley in eighty two, and then came back, and I was fortunate. We got married in in that same year, nineteen in the fall of eighty two. Alva and I got married, still together now. Almost 36 years later. Congrats. That's awesome. Thanks. And uh, so your time at Berkeley, were there any other fellow students that you met or knew who eventually made it like pretty big? Yes. Um, while I was there, you know, there, there are people that go to Berkeley just to have that Berkeley name attached to the resume sure, sure. and who can already play before they get there. Um, and, and some of those people, like uh, Bradford Marsalis was wow. there okay. when I was there. Um, Makoto Ozone, the pianist, yep. Japanese pianist, was there when I was there. Uh, no, I, I, I rubbed elbows with some of those guys. Um, Winton was just there for a hiccup. He, he, I don't even think he was enrolled, but you know, he made his <laughs> presence known. Bradford was, was really the brother who was, who was there. Uh, but... Uh, among my peers, uh, I'm, I met a tenor saxophone player who was a really talented, very soulful player named Wayne De Silva. And uh, he is, is originally from Hawaii. He settled into the uh, Las Vegas scene. Okay. And that's where he's been living uh, for the last 20 years or so, or 25 years. Uh, I recently uh, hooked up with him. He came to visit us. And he was in our wedding. You know, we've got to be best friends. He's a really great player. And in fact, uh, we're putting together as we speak a live um, a live compilation, half from this place from last month and half from 2000, August 2016 when I had Wayne uh, as a guest artist appear with my group up at uh, the barn in Liberty. Oh, okay. Wayne played my alto because he didn't bring his horn for the trip. So he's a tenor <laughs> player, but he was playing alto, and he absolutely killed it. There's two tracks on that, of my original, it's all my original music, two tracks on that CD coming out feature Wayne De Silva, and uh, one track from our jam here features uh, Joe Lovano on Sopranos. Gotcha, Science. okay, yeah. yeah. Yes, the Joe Lovano was here in oh, yeah. New York. He what, frequented what, three, three weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and he'll be here in October as well. Awesome, that's great. Yeah, him and his wife Judy, great people. So eventually, you uh, you got into teaching. So you've been playing with a lot of bands over the years, but you eventually wound up being a music teacher, which uh, yeah, pretty pretty cool. I think that a lot of musicians who go and study music in you know whether it be Berkeley or, or whatever, eventually they either want to be become professional musicians or they wind up teaching. So you actually wound up kind of doing both. Yeah. Uh, I, ironically, you know, Pete, I never wanted to be a teacher. In fact, during my whole public school career, I refused to teach on the side, even though there was, you know, it's pretty lucrative. But I decided that that would really hinder my performance opportunities. Because, because I, you know, it fills up your schedule. Oh, yeah. And, and yeah, teaching, sure. is, te teaching is a block of time that... You know, the school schedule, although people say, oh, you have lots of time off, but there's a lot on your mind and a lot of things you have to prepare for and do when when you're in that that season, let's say. So, you know, to, to take a gig on a Wednesday night and stay out till one o'clock in the morning and then, and then go teach Thursday, it's tough. So I kept my weekends free and my evenings, you know, to where I could practice and write and do things. And of course, I had the growing family, too. So. To me, teaching in a public school was a great source of income. I met a lot of beautiful people. I had great students, a lot of fun doing it. But my, during that whole time, my passion was not for teaching. My passion was for music and playing music. And if I could, you know, 
in some way impart that to my students, then that was my, uh, that passion. If I get my right. students to be passionate about music or about anything really, but that was my tool. Music was my tool to explain what passion means to these kids and get them interested in something. And I, you know, I don't even well, I care. Think a lot of young kids kind of struggle with that when they're in that kind of, uh, that phase of their life where they need to start thinking about what they want to do with their lives. And whether it's music or whether it's uh, the medical arts or whether it's uh, teaching or sports or, you know, you want to go into the military, whatever, you need to have some kind of passion. And yeah. You need to learn how to look within yourself and discover that passion, let it come out. So that's really kind of cool to hear from you about how you try to impart that upon your students, mm -hmm. to discover that from within themselves. Because you can't just go to, to a child and say, this is what you should do with your life. Right, right, right. You can't, you can't do that. It has to be what feels right from here, right? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I try to approach my, my teaching career from a point of always being creative, and I try not to get caught up in the political part of it, you know, and the, uh, I avoided the teacher's room at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong. With, no, I'm not getting, saying it was anything wrong with the teachers or, or the room itself, but things that were said and, and, and you know, that, I'm not there to listen to the gripes about the system or the right. this and that. Did you hear about that? You know, I didn't really care about any of that because I, I was very, very adamant about keeping my personal life and my teaching life separate. separate. Yeah. So when you're teaching, your focus is on them. Yeah. The kids, right? It's yeah. on the kids. And, you know, and as far as the rest of it, when I closed, you know, I left that classroom at the end of the day, I'm, I'm out. You know, I'm not going back there. Shut it off until the next day or the next time I was supposed to be there. And, you know, and that's how I approached it like any other um, business and job. And, and I was very lucky to have lots of great people in the, in the district over the years. I taught in every single building. I started out as an elementary teacher, music band, uh, spent three years, went to the high school, spent 11 years at the high school. And then another seven years uh, back at uh, elementary to, to finish so my So did career. you find, it's always interesting to kind of think about this, did you find the students that enrolled in your, in your classes, how, what was the percentage of them who really had an interest in music versus the ones who was just like, well, it's not math and it's not science, so I want to take that. And they're just in it just to not have to do something else. That's a great question. Um, in the elementary years, you had more of the students who were nine and ten years old who were just trying it because something new, right? Something to do. Yeah. Uh, it was a way to get out of math and science lectures. Uh, uh, their friends were doing it. Uh, it seemed kind of cool. Mom could rent an instrument yep. for fifteen dollars for for five months, and then I could decide later if I like it or not. Right. Um, and that was pretty much the attitude. Some caught on, and the ones who who, ca who catch on, um, you know, keep that going. And and when they get to high school, then most of those kids who have done it since elementary, they have some doing? kind of passion about it, or they would still be involved, right? You know, right. and and that's when you kind of doing? weed out the, the tree. Hey, Mike. So. so fast forward to 2017. Right, so you put in your time, mm -hmm. and it was that time to 2018 to walk away. 2018, so it was recently yeah. to walk yeah. away. So retire from teaching, next phase in life, and here we have this. So how did how did this whole idea come to, to come to be? Cool. So where did where did the beer come in? We we'll pause it here one second. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he needs my attention. Oh, okay. Got it. <laughs> I'll keep talking. Sam, come on in here. <clears throat> come on. We're in a live business, guys, so this this kind of thing happens. So I want to introduce you to a friend of mine. This is my friend Sam. Sam Warrick, who's also another local guy. Uh, Sam is also from the Newburgh, Walk Hill area here in uh, Orange County, New York. And uh, Sam and I actually came here to get. The, you were actually, I think you came here before I did. Correct, I did. And then brought me here uh, shortly thereafter. So um, Sam is also a lifelong music fan. 
perfect. Yep. Fan of all these kind of breweries and things like that. So uh, breweries. Yep. We've been to many of them. Yep, yep, yep. There's, uh, My I mean, goal is to buy every brewery shirt I can possibly get. <laughs> That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> and how many? How many have you been right. to like in the last like couple of months? Because they're popping up all over the place in this area. Correct. Of, uh, they are. I think altogether, yes. probably about 15 That's here it. in Hudson Valley, up and down the north. From I would say from Troy, New York, on to Peekskill, down down Ulster, Orange County, up in the Albany area, Dutchess County, all over the place. Up yeah. In Glens Falls, uh, both in Landing. Absolutely. So in, in this neck of the woods, you've got a wide variety of them. So there are some that. Just do beer. That's it. There are some that also have kitchens and they Correct. do like a lot of locally sourced uh, foods and entrees and things like that. You have some that have live music fairly regularly as well. Yes. Some that do all three. Um, I mean, how important do you think it is to kind of do all three or is it, or is it, is it not a bad idea just to concentrate on the beer and do nothing else? Well, what I look for when I go to a brewery um, is a brewery that would have entertainment for one. Um, would have um, actually meals, good meals to eat, good bar food, and um, their merchandising. Yeah. Uh, do they sell hats? Do they sell shirt shirts? Do they sell glasses? Glasses, glass things, things like that. Things yeah. like that. That would be nice. That's, there's larger ones in Hudson Valley that do that, and there's smaller ones that don't do that. But, um, the craft beer in Hudson Valley is just like tremendously great. It's just getting bigger and bigger is what I've been seeing. And, um, I read an article recently on online that talked about how the craft brewing craze that's going on here in New York right now, they're comparing it to what's been going on in like Napa Valley with wineries in yes. California. Um, and it's just like that. In fact, if you go out to that section of California, there are wineries popping up all over the place that create. And they're making their own wine. They're serving food. They're having music, crafts, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. And that's kind of what's happening here, especially in, in like the Hudson Valley of New York, <clears throat> yeah. where you have these breweries popping up all over the place. There's many wineries around here as well. Right. Local here in the Hudson Valley, they're doing the same thing. They're doing entertainment. They're doing meals. Um, specializing in sours, or actually breweries specialize in sours, but the wineries around here are also presenting good meals along with the foods yeah. that they have and, and, and wines. And, so. and in some cases, they're they're doing the pairings too, the pairings which is good. Well. They're pairing like they're either preparing yeah. meals with certain kinds of beers, or they're doing like pairing menus and things like that. Yeah. So, which is great. So, I encourage you to come on down. Thanks. Have a beer. Thank you. That's part of this, yes. I'm by on Friday nights and listen to some jazz music. That's right. All right. Speaking of jazz, Mike is Mike, Mike is ready is to pop back, back in. Okay. So Sam, thanks a lot for You're stopping welcome. in and Bye. talking a little bit about the the local brewery uh, thing going on here in New York. So that's yeah. kind of so. Sorry about that. That was a little business. And it happens. It happens. We, we, we've done live. We've done these live things in, in other places before where it happens. It's, it's not a big deal. So um, so where we left off is that uh, so you retired from teaching. And so how, did, how does the whole beer thing come into it? So when did you get started in, you know, craft brewing or, you know, whatever? Where did the, where did the thought of putting together something like this establish? Well, um, I've always loved beer. Uh, I love Who doesn't love beer? Know, beer, beer is uh, <laughs> one of my favorites. But uh, back in the high school days, not my high school, but my high school teaching days, I had a principal named, uh, I could Say his name here, Daryl Imperati. He was a great principal. And uh, he was running the show at our high school, and he also ran a beer club wow. for homebrewers. So a bunch of the men at the high school were part of this beer club, and we'd go to Daryl's house. Which is something you didn't think of, hear about a lot back in right. the late 70s, right? No, 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 no. Not when I was in high school. Oh, okay. When gotcha. I was teaching high school. Oh, when you were teaching this high school. Is, okay, about, gotcha. I was gonna, this is not that long ago. Okay. No, gotcha. this, is, okay. this is in the early 2000s. Okay, yeah, right. then it was big, yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, we all would take turns presenting a beer, a beer of the month, so to speak. And uh, once a month we'd, we'd go there and we'd compare each other's beers on a Friday night. And we'd have a good time and have some food, laughs. And um, it turned out that my beer was actually pretty good most of the time. <laughs> so I, I, I got a little passion started for, for brewing beer. And I said, well, let's try to make something a little different, something a little better. And... Uh, Eventually, I bought some uh, hop rhizomes, planted them, and that same year, the first year I planted the hop rhizomes, we entered some beers, and I entered a string of hops 
in the Dutchess County Fair um, 4-H show, I won best of show for hop vines in the fair. Wow. We could grow hops. That you're you're onto something. I'm onto something there. Our property <laughs> likes hops or, or vice versa. Our, the hops like our property. Well, we happen to have a, a, a parcel that's 18 acres. And, uh, you know, we didn't really know what we we're going to do with all that land. So we we'll fast forward. I've been brewing beer since, let's say, 15 years as a home brewer. I went to Old Grain. I've been doing it like monthly since then. Um, in 2013, in the fall, Alvin and I went to a, a uh, hop uh, harvest festival. It was called Hop Timber, and it was by Duchess Hops. It's a little farm over in LaGrange. And they had about three acres of hops planting, and I got to see the trellis work and the hops growing. It was a nice little party. They had music. It was, it was fun. And I looked at Alva, and she looked at me, and I go, wow. Forget the alpaca and the Christmas trees and the fruit trees <laughs> and the onions or whatever else we're going to grow with this land. Yep. You know, let's grow hops. You know, yeah. we can do this. You know, Why not? Well, little did I know that. She agreed. You know, I was shocked that she usually says that's a harebrained scheme and it's not going to work, you know. <laughs> but this one, she fell for it. And by 2014, in the spring, we had a thousand hop plants wow. planted wow. by Mother's Day of 2014. From September of 2013 to, to, uh, to uh, May of 2014. And if you go on the website, you could see a little blog about our experience. I documented the entire process of building that hop farm in that six months, and it still exists today. That's great. Yeah. That's great. So you're growing the hops, and you started up a friendship and a business relationship with a Roscoe, Roscoe Brewing, Brewing, Company. Roscoe Brewing Company. So yeah. how, how did they find out about you? We were uh, opposite each other. In uh, in the hallway, everybody had these little booths at uh, indoors at uh, the Tap New York Festival. Yeah, yeah. So I met Josh Hughes because I needed a way to tap my homebrew keg that I brought up, and I didn't have the right apparatus to tap it. I left it at home, and I approached Josh, and he said, "Sure, I, I got something in the van. Try this." And so he came down to our. We were staying over, and we had a little uh, trailer, and he came down. And shared a few beers with me. And he said, well, your beer is pretty good. And I said, well, would you like to buy our hops? And he said, yeah, we can always use, you know, fresh hops. Now, little did I know that that startup company was in its first year as well. They've been buying hops since us, uh, from us since that time, 2014. And in the three years between the first purchase of hops from, from them or uh, by them from us until... 2017, in that three-year period, they quadrupled or maybe quintupled their capacity, and they had their initial brewing system in storage. Mm. So I approached Josh when this building uh, came, uh, my neighbor's building came available. I said, mm, "Wow, we've got the hops. He's got the brewing equipment. Maybe we can work this out." So, you know, you can tie all the pieces together oh, from sure. there. But but that's what happened. So. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with the Roscoe Brewing Company name, uh, you probably or might have heard or had the Trout Town beers. That's theirs. Very, very good stuff. So um, so this is, so you open this place, which is on Route 52, like I mentioned at the top of the show, between uh, Newburgh and Walden. And it's basically, like what, what was this building before? It's a small little building right on the side of the road, right on the road. Right on 52. Yeah, uh, it, it was it most recently uh, two, a two-unit uh, rental on on the uh, east side was an antique store, and on on this side, that's where which we uh, turned into a tasting room, was a call center most recently, and it was there was a storage area. A contractor was renting it, keeping his equipment in here, uh, but originally back in the 30s, this was. Ozzy Connor's general store, hmm. and the other side was an automotive repair place. I, I can see that. 
So, so they got they, a bay they, over there. Yeah, right they there. had two 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 garage doors, and they actually had a pit and a lift. And the pit was originally before they had the lift. They had the pit where you know the car drove in, and there were stairs going down underneath the car. You walked down into the the basement with the car above you, so you could <laughs> change the oil and whatnot. You know, and that was uh, that was the history of this place. So it was the first general store automotive repair slash place. You know, in this area, way before uh, AutoZone and, <laughs> and uh, you know, Dollar General. Exactly, yep, yep. <laughs> so, how, so you've been open for how long out here in this, in this building? Uh, officially, we, we started on uh, June 9th. June 9th, okay. Yeah, so just a couple months. So basically just for now, just Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, limited hours for yeah. now. Um, as you can see... They've got a stage behind us, the, the actual the, the bar, the taps are all in front of us. We've got live music here fairly often. Uh, fairly often. You know, I'm, I'm not advertising uh, as much because we, um, our musicians come here um, and work basically for, for um, donations. Right. So we're not, we're not paying anybody. We're not actually advertising uh, for musicians and bands like that. But... Being that I've been a musician since professionally since 1978, I've, I know a lot of people, and they're happy to come and and share their their spirit and their souls yeah. here on the stage. Well, for them, it could be a nice jam session because we've got a great time to work out material before we actually go play another gig, right? Yeah. And and the, the people who are here watching and enjoying the beer probably love it. Yeah, it's a very very uh, comfortable environment, let's say. And we like to think that we've uh, produced. Uh, a place that will be thought of as, you know, jazz in your living room. Right. You know, jazz. Exactly. And then not only jazz, we had a blues band here the other yeah, night. and it was good. I was here. <laughs> um, uh, it's, you never know what's going to happen and who's going to come in. And exactly. some, some people are very famous and, and some not. Um, talk a little bit about some of the beers that you've, uh, that you've created. Okay. The establishment. I know. I know. My favorite is not on tap at the moment. I think I had the last pint of it. You did. The Papa Louis Pale. Papa Louis. And, and what's really interesting is almost all their beers are named after wooden sculptures that this guy has actually created. So actually, Papa yeah. Louis is like right behind us here. So we're going to move. We're going to move out of the way so you can see Papa. Louis. This this is actually Papa Louis right here. This is a, a uh, wooden carving. Yeah, chainsaw uh, only. Chainsaw only. That's Papa Louis. So Mr. Mike created a beer from him. We've got, uh, oh, uh, the Alligator. So Alligator IPA. The Alligator's yeah. right behind us here. Uh, there's, what else we got? White Jackass. Jackass is over by the door. The, Whitey Wheat is, Whitey's based on the... Um, the deer. The deer. The white deer. Right, the white deer, the albino we had deer. The, we had the mermaid summer. That's right. Yeah, magic, the mermaid. So there's, there's not coming just, is the Pelican Quarter. There we go. Yeah, when is that coming? It's well, the Vanilla soon. Quarter. Yeah. Soon, right. Yeah. Well, the, the the weather's getting cooler, so everyone's ready yeah. for it. So, um, so what do you, uh, if you could look into your crystal ball, say six months from now, a year from now, what is your kind of goals for this place? I mean, it, it's great the way it is, but do you have anything bigger in mind, like maybe uh, opening it up more during the week, maybe adding food at some point, a lot more beers? Like, what, what kind of, the, what are some of the things that you're working on right now? Right now, I'm just trying to take baby steps and, okay. and trying to get our, uh, our place established. Uh, I would like to keep between five and eight beers of my own on tap. And then also we keep Roscoe's, some of Roscoe's. They're very good beers. And they, you know, as, as much as we want to provide our own uh, beer here, we like to, to sell Roscoe's as well because they use our hops right. in their sure. beer. And, and it's, it's a reciprocal relationship we have with them. Yeah, that's a good thing. We also offer wines from a local winery, uh, New York cider. State wines. Cider too. Yeah, from Angry yeah, Orchard. And we have cider from, they used hops. Uh, all the companies that we, uh, beer and uh, cider, and we also have now distilled spirits, every single company uh, uses our hops that we, that we sell their product. Here. So it's all so. in the family. It's which, all in the family. Which is good. Which is good. Yeah. So the, to answer your question about, you know, the expansion and so forth, I like to play it by ear. Mm -hmm. 
uh, not to use some musical pun, <laughs> but um, we really are improvising, you know, all the time. We're finding out what works day by day, what doesn't work, and whatever direction that we ultimately go in, I hope that we can maintain this homey atmosphere and keep this a neighborhood place where people can come and enjoy a, a couple of pints and some live music and maybe some sports on, on TV or, it's all about, right? or, you know, even showing uh, something from YouTube, you know, maybe we can show your, your, uh, some of your interviews on here. Hey, and have I love a Pete it. Pardo night. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love it. People can hear, hear about, you know, Jethro Tull and right. yes and rush and, you know, whatever. So that, that'd be fun. That'd be fun. So uh, I, I do want to mention before we uh, kind of wrap things up today that, uh, Mike and some of his musical friends put together this really wonderful CD about a, what, about a decade ago. Yeah, this is uh, Michael's Jazz Quartet, Woody and Me. Some of you who follow our reviews on our website probably saw a review of this about two weeks ago. Um, really good stuff. Any plans for doing something else? I know you, we, we've talked about it and you want to let them know yeah. that there is a live there's album. A, there's really a live album coming out that, that features a couple of guest artists. Um, Two members, myself and, and the bass player, are the same from this from this uh, recording. And the person who actually um, uh, recorded that for us, that was recorded live in my living room at home. Actually, wow, you know, and great sound. Reminiscent. Yeah. People have said uh, I've had reviewer reviewers say it was reminiscent of the old Van Gelder recordings from from Englewood, New Jersey. You know, yeah. back in the Blue Note early Blue Note days. Yeah, right? those are great. Yeah, they're so warm and inviting. Yeah, that's one of the things that I mentioned. No, and I didn't know that. And one of the things I mentioned in my review was how warm and inviting this recording sounds. Go figure. Yeah. <laughs> Spot on, Pete. Go figure. Again, I, 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 I did not. I'm not just playing that. Up. I did not know no, that they recorded. No, I can vouch for him. He's telling the truth. Yes. Uh, yeah. Some, but sometimes you can, and not all forms of music could you tell something like that. Jazz is a totally, totally different genre where you can certain subtleties can bring on thoughts of okay, where where did they record this or what was the vibe going on at the time? And you, you can't get that from a rock album generally. Or, you know, uh, like a, a synthesized pop album or something like that. Jazz is so different. It's so organic. And, and that's that's the first thing when I listened to this. I was like, man, that's something about this. It's like it's like the guys are sitting right in your living room. Well, we were. Right, yeah, in your own, <laughs> right? Not in mine, but that's what I play. I, <laughs> yeah. So getting back to that, the engineer for this and the recording uh, engineer is also a fantastic drummer. And he has been working with us recently. So he's going to be uh, on our live album not only as the recording engineer but on half the tracks as the drummer that we we used back in uh 2016 we did the live at the barn in liberty new york and then the the set uh, as i mentioned my friend wayne de silva on alto saxophone and the great joe lovano on soprano for one tune that was recorded here uh, last month yep Cool. Uh, I'm really excited to have that coming. Yeah, I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to hearing that absolutely for and, now though be on the lookout for that for yeah, now it, if you go on to what cd baby and amazon yeah, you can, find, you can find this. So again, yeah. it's Michael's Jazz Quartet. Uh, Woody and Me is the name of the uh, name of the series. You can listen to us on uh, Pandora Radio too. Okay, great. Uh, we're on, we have my own station called Michael's Jazz Radio. Cool. Um, and also uh, the uh, three of the tunes, including the one uh, that features Joe Lovano, were videotaped right here. So they're also, if you go to the brewery at Orange County Hops. YouTube page, YouTube, yep. you can uh, download the videos and watch the videos I've seen from, a from, the, pretty from the live, uh, yeah. live album. Good stuff. Yeah. Sounds good. So um, once again, we're here from the brewery at Orange County Hops. Uh, Mike, where, where can everybody find you on the internet here? Got a Facebook page, right? So, yeah, we have Facebook. Just just Google uh, the brewery at Orange County Hops or orangecountyhops.com is our website. And that would lead you also to the Facebook and other places. Cool. Lots of good stuff coming out. We got music, lots more beer and things to happen and uh, you never know, we might be back here again someday doing another live broadcast. So uh, so till then, this is on the web at www.chtranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on the Mighty YouTube each and every week, sometimes more often than that. So once again, Mike Antonelli, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you, Pete. Alva, thank you. I know you didn't want to come on, on the camera today, but thanks yeah. thanks for Sam. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you guys next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.